Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Crime and Entertainment. Now, I have here probably the smartest guest I've ever had on this show because I don't, I don't have the 15 minutes it would take to list all this man's accolades, so I'm going to just do a few. He is professor of physics and astronomy, vice president of teaching and learning, and dean division of undergrad education. Is that it? Undergraduate that education? That is it. Undergraduate education. Wow, so I got all those right, so I'm going to stop so I don't mess up anything. Please welcome to the show Michael Denon. Michael, how are you, my friend? Oh, I'm great. It's great to be here. I, I always love talking about stuff. Yeah. Um, I, have, I'm, I, I, I was a little nervous that crime was the first word because I haven't done that yet, but entertainment, definitely. Well, see, that is the exact reason why I chose that name because originally – I was going to do like a true crime podcast, but then I was like, you know, especially during the pandemic, the, the podcast world got saturated. Everybody seemed like they wanted to make a true right. crime podcast. So by adding that little entertainment on the end, I can really kind of like you, I can talk about whatever and it still fits the demographic of the show. So you know, I do have to tell you a little secret though, that I've always thought was true, you know, as a professor at a university in academics, I think the university was created to keep a whole bunch of us who would be white collar criminals distracted um, by other stuff. I, I, I believe that. I'm, I'm, yeah, it's society's secret protective mechanism. I would sign off on that for sure. <laughs> now, you've actually been on a number of TV shows. You're on Ancient Aliens. Um, what was it? Uh, Batman Tech? Yeah, a whole tech series. I did Science of Superman, Spider Man Tech, Batman Tech, and Star Wars Tech. Wow. Okay, so yeah. what all did those shows entail before we get into you and your background? Because that's got my curiosity peaked. So I love doing what I call the science of X, where X is anything except politics. Um, <laughs> I figure that's a dangerous topic. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, so, so I love doing science of superheroes um, or any sort of pop culture stuff, fantasy, magic. Um, and so... What was great about Spider-Man tech, Super Science of Superman, Batman tech, and Star Wars tech um, is we got to look at the superheroes, look at Star Wars, look at these people, and talk about what could you really do with today's technology, what might you do with future technology, and what was just the writers and directors having a lot of fun. Um, and so it was a bunch of scientists, a bunch of writers and directors with the shows, um, and you kind of got to see both sides. So I really enjoyed doing that. Okay. Yeah, that's neat. Um, I actually interviewed, and I can't remember his name right now, it's off the top of my head, but another guy that was on Ancient Aliens. That's an interesting show because you've got a cast of characters on there, and it seems like to me that the few episodes that I watched that I went and seen you in, they kind of go with you to bring it back down to reality a little bit. <laughs> yes. Uh, my, my tagline is, I am the friendly skeptic. Okay. Um, I'm the person who thinks people built everything in the past. Um, but I also do, I mean, there's a lot of really cool science questions that come up when you talk about the universe, space travel, aliens, the past, building stuff, materials. You know, how would you, how do you even just make fascinating materials? And so that I love talking about the science of that. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I'm usually there to, to be um, less about the alien question, more just about the cool science involved in it. Right. So before we get into all that, let's just kind of step back real quick and just give us a brief uh, description, kind of like where you grew up and then what led you into these fields? Because everybody has that point in time where something happens in their life. It might be young. It might be later on. But it's like, OK, I think this is what I want to do or at least try my hand at. So give us a little bit of background here. So I definitely grew up a science fiction fantasy nut. Okay. I read, you know, Isaac Asimov, Tolkien, everything. I am of the original generation that played Dungeons and Dragons before it was cool. Um, so it's nice to nice to see. It took 50 plus years, but I am finally cool. <laughs> um, but I really, I mean, I was fascinated as a kid with space travel. Um, I When Star Wars came out, that was like transformative for my life. Um, so I always kind of had in my mind that I would love to do something like that. I also absolutely love history. It's kind of two weird passions. And I will tell you, this is what I tell students, you know, the path in college is, you know, just be open to random things. I realized in history, you had to write a lot. I didn't like to write a lot. Um, I was into math, but I had a math professor tell me I once did a homework problem the way a physicist would. So I thought, hey, 
that probably means I should be a physics major. <laughs> um, the only sad twist is I went into eventually studying basically materials, foams, bubbles, um, interesting complex materials, nothing that would ever get me into space. Right. So despite, despite the dream of going to space, I am also the kid who in high school tried to design his own hyperdrive. Um, not very successfully, um, but, but that's where my brain was. So, you know, I, I, I've gotten, what I tell people though, is I've gotten to, you know, have a job that was my passion, which was talking about physics, studying physics, doing it. And then partway through my kind of career, just as a physics professor, I did a course on the science of superheroes through some random sort of connections. Um, the Orange County Science Times did an article on it. The LA Times did an article on it. And then a production company called me to do the science of Superman. And so I made this leap to getting to do TV podcasts and having just a lot of fun. So it was partly a random walk, but I think partly paying attention to what I, I loved. So is that still an active class? You still teach that? It comes and goes, you know, okay. now that I'm, now that I'm sort of the vice provost for teaching and learning and Dean of undergraduate education, I've gone to the dark side of academics that I'm an administrator. Uh, so I don't get to teach quite as much. Okay. Um, but there is actually still a free online version people can find. If you just Google Michael Denon's Science of Superheroes, you can get to it from various places. Okay. Um, and you can see what we did in that. So it's, it was, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I made, I made people design their own superhero and then evaluate if it was realistic. You kind of had to do both. <laughs> wow. I bet that would have been a, cool to see some of the things that people would come yeah. up with. Yeah, no, people are very creative. They they do seem to really love electricity. They love shocking people and sending lightning bolts. That was, I think, number one superpower people take for reasons I don't know. Combat or something there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, what was like the coolest one that somebody come up with? What was their powers? Um, you know, I I think there was a person who did something really fun with magnetism. And I know it's kind of magnetoish, um, but it was both fun things with magnets, but also fairly realistic things with magnets. And that's what I really liked. Um, I, I happen to think magnetism is, is fascinating and underutilized. So that was really cool for me to see a student do that. They also, I can't even describe it because I'm horrible with art. I allowed them to, for extra points, like draw their superhero. Right. And I will say this person had the best costume I've ever seen. So... <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it's lost somewhere. You know, it's these sort of things you wish you saved when you were a professor, and then you failed to keep track of. So, when you get to like astronomy, so like what part of that is is the key? Because I know so, when people think ancient aliens, they might think, "Oh, well, you're, you know, UFOs, extraterrestrials." What is kind of like your forte into that? Is it the is it that, or is it something else? Is that I know that kind of those are kind of things that go hand in hand when you think about space. Obviously, you know, sooner or later. Right. That kind of play a part, but you know, what was kind of your forte and then what is your take on extraterrestrial activity, you, your beliefs and whatnot? Right. So, so my, my main sort of personal specialty I bring to the show is my understanding of materials. Um, like I said, I study foams, um, basically shaving cream, but the stuff we do, it really is a way to mimic and understand metals and plastics and how materials bend and fold and all their properties. So that's like my core expertise, but the nice thing about being a physics professor in a physics and astronomy department, even though I don't study astronomy specifically like full time, we're always having people come in and give talks. So the nice thing is I get to stay pretty up to date on sort of everything physics and astronomy. Right. And what's been exciting about that is, you know, we finally have telescopes big enough to see planets outside the solar system, you know, the James Webb, the newest telescope is just super cool and exciting. And we're starting to see atmospheres and measure stuff. Um, I, I get to teach about special and general relativity, which is how you would do space travel. So I bring a lot of sort of basic knowledge. And I joke that I understand it just well enough that I can explain it to non-physicists. If I understood it any better, I'd become incomprehensible. <laughs> Right. <laughs> no, well, that's a good balance to be able to explain it to people that don't have the, the level of knowledge, you know, on that subject. Yeah. That's a good balance. Yeah. So that's where I went. And then, you know, it's funny when it comes to aliens, I'm one of the people who very, very strongly believes there's aliens out there, but they haven't made it here yet. Um, At all, I, you think? Yeah, I don't think they've been here yet. You know, I mean, it's interesting to think about, you know, 
if they had come in the past, my mind is, why didn't they just stay and conquer everything? That's what we do when we go somewhere new. But maybe they're different. Maybe they just pass through. So, so you the don't pass the whole Area 51 deal that one of them crashed, something along Yeah, that. no, for me, that's not like if anything sort of an unalien, if that's the word to use for an unmanned alien probe, an unaliened probe, um, you know, that's the best I think that would have come here by now. I do think we're, you know, sort of, and, and the reason I think this is largely because of just time scales, right? We know that we're not quite to space travel yet. We know how fast life kind of evolves, planets evolve, and we know how far away they are, right? So when you take all that into account, even if they're ahead of us, they're probably not far enough ahead to get here yet, but it's probably getting close. You know, yeah. I think that's the interesting thing to me. Like, are we going to be the first to get out there? And so it's going to be us meeting them, or are they going to get here first and them meeting us? I, I, I'm, I'm not willing to place the bet. I think either, I think we're 50, 50 right now on either of those. Yeah. I mean, that, that's one of those things that we're like, I guess people have to make their own assumptions. Obviously I've never yep. seen or, you know, been a part of anything related to alien activity. So I can't say 100%. Yeah, it's real, but you have so many stories that are fairly convincing. Uh, Bob Lazar, you know, in his, yep. his store being one, um, obviously Travis Walton and his story, you know, very compelling. Um, a lot of those guys pass polygraphs on the effect of what happened, yep. you know, out there in those woods, even he, the guy I spoke with on a previous episode, he said that even Travis Walton said a lot of what was in the movie fire in the sky was highly fabricated as far as like what happened while he was there. He said, yeah. that, you know, and this is his words, but most of like what was going on was they were almost making sure he was okay. It wasn't like they were, you know, dissecting him and using him right. for research and everything that was kind of dramatized for Hollywood's sake, uh, so to speak. But, you know, I think there's definitely something there. Back in those days, I think probably a little bit more easier to fool somebody. Now, I can see where people would really be skeptics because with the capabilities of technology and editing software and stuff with phones and apps, I mean, God, I could put an alien behind me right now and he goes <laughs> like he's real. So it's definitely harder to believe and fathom nowadays, I think. Well, and also, you know what? I, I, I realize now, I should have realized this when we started, this is the connection to the crime part of the name of your title. Yeah. When you think about these things, they're much more like a, an investigation of a crime. Absolutely. And that's the challenge for people. Like you said, you know, it's really the case of it's it's a one-off event. You know, some some are definitely hoaxes. Some something definitely happened. Yeah. We just don't know what, right? And that's usually the problem in like a crime, you you know something happened. Right. You just don't know what. And depending on how much pieces of evidence, you can make different conclusions, which is very different. This is why I tell people at the moment, it's still not a science question because right. a science question requires an experiment and being able to reproduce it and repeat it under controlled conditions. You can't do that. These are all things that just happen out in the field. So it's much more like investigating a crime. And that's kind of a different skill set, not my skill set. Um, you know, so I do the best I can come to my conclusions. And like you said, other people look at it and they judge the evidence, you know, the way they think makes most sense to them. Yeah. Um, if you had to pick a movie that would represent probably the closest of what you think maybe the alien thought process is, I mean, is it, is it more like an independence day? Like if they were wanting to come here, they were strategically placed <laughs> around the world and maybe not necessarily do exactly what they did there and, and wipe out everybody, but kind of put the pieces in place and, and do a takeover or, so, so there's what I hope and there's what I guess, right? Yeah, so yeah, I hope I not. I, I want to hear both. Obviously, I hope, hope we don't die. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I will tell you my honest guess is, I mean, I think even for us, I think I look at our trajectory and what it would take to achieve space flight, right? And I think we are not going to be successful with any serious space exploration while we're still beating up on each other. Right. So I... It's a tough one, right? Because if you look at how we've expanded around the earth, it's been through basically making our empires bigger, mm -hmm. right? So it is conquest. So on the one hand, it's natural to think, okay, if you're going to go out into space, it's going to be about conquest. But I'm a huge Star Trek believer. Now, I know the ship Enterprise had military capabilities, 
But by that time, if you think about it, you know, the Federation at least was fundamentally peaceful. Right. Um, and okay, you can argue the Klingons weren't, whatever. But I do think, I, I, I do think to be that successful in space travel, you have to reach a certain level of thinking of cooperation over conquest. Yeah. So I, I'd probably put it at a 70 30 that if aliens came here, it'd be more like, you know, an ET who's friendly and wants to help or, you know, one of that, those situations, or they would get here, see, we weren't quite there yet and ignore us, like, like leave us alone for a little bit. They're not on the left yet. (laughs) Yeah. 30% chance it's independence day. They just want to take over. (laughs) If they come here and see what the state of the world was in right now, they'd probably be like, I'll pass. I'll come back. Yeah, exactly. Let them, let them get it together down there before we come. It'd be more yep. of a burden to clean it up. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> well, speaking of, speaking of cleaning it up, like I, some of the, the podcasts that I listened to today, we talked about possible or not. We, but you guys talked about possible, like end of the world disasters that could happen, you know, especially in lieu of comments and stuff like that. Right. Um, because it lately we've had some this past close by, but with the, I'm assuming with these new telescopes and stuff you were mentioned, y'all have the capabilities to see that. Would that be related? You think if there was one headed to us and it was going to be what they, I'll, I'll steal the term from the Armageddon movie, a global killer. Right. Would that message you think be relayed or probably not because of the panic it would instill in the world? Uh, that's a good question. You know, I mean, I, I hope, um, you know, Obviously, like the recent pandemic got very politicized very quickly. Right. Um, you know, the nice thing about a meteor coming in from that perspective is about the only people who can do anything about it is the government. Right. Um, so I don't know. I, I would think they've learned not to panic people and you take care of it and then just let people know what happened <laughs> and that they're safe. Um, I mean, I think that's one of the things that makes me feel a little... Um, better about the meteor option is one, our detection systems are way better. Our ability to calculate is way better. And we do have some tools for changing trajectories, for, you know, launching things in the right place into space uh, um, and be a little bit protective. Um, so we do have things that could do that. Say, if I think so. High, high volume. Like yeah. I, think, I think they made reference in the movie that uh, it was the size of Texas heading to the earth if you had something that big coming this way, y'all would have the capabilities of doing something to change the trajectory. Yeah. I mean, the nice thing is particularly our ability to see far out, our ability to do calculations. Um, You know, if anyone's played golf, like I have, you know, a small angle makes a a big difference as to whether you're in the woods or on the fairway (laughs) Um, and space is even farther away. So you don't have to, you don't have to knock these things much off their path. Um, and, and then they become a miss or skim the atmosphere and bounce off or, you know, do other things. So it, it does take catching them early. Um, right. But again, we have much better telescopes and we're much more likely to do that. So um, I, I think the, that the line that Billy Bob Thornton said, and it, it always kind of cracked me up was he's like, how did we not see this coming? And he's like, well, our, you know, budget only allows us to track like a small percentage of the sky. And he's like, sir, it's a big ass sky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, I love that. I love that. Well, it's funny. if you, So if you listen to some of those, one of the things, um, you know, I'll put in my shameless plug for our, our podcast where we talk about all these um, pop culture stuff, which is the fascinating gadgets, gizmos, and gear-based technology, or FGGGT.com, like we like to call it. And I am known on that for being an apocalypse denier. Um, that's one of... Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I have a deep belief we're going to make it through and not have an apocalypse. Um, so we can rule out, co- you know, meteors. You and I just talked about that. I will say the pandemic has made me nervous. Um, climate change has made me nervous, yeah. but I'm still holding on. We're not going to have an apocalypse. We're going to figure it out and make it through. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good news for everybody. Because um, I think I feel like, you know, if, if they did just say something like that was to happen, I don't know if telling the world would be the smartest thing because you would have a definitely a panic. Maybe when yeah. it got close to the point to where you're talking days, maybe let everybody know. But like, because yeah. I know if I know a month ahead of time that this is coming, I'm not going to work. No, <laughs> no I think the cool in. thing is you, you take care of it. 
And then probably it's still going to come close enough and it'll make a cool meteor shower, but nothing right. dangerous. And you let everyone know when to look up for the meteor shower. Yeah, yeah. So, just like the government, they're going to cover it up and let, give you what you need to know. That is the <laughs> way they operate, 100%. Yep. <laughs> um, so that's cool. I mean, and I, I was thinking, and I think you guys talked about that on a show that I was listening to too, the moon actually does a lot to protect the earth from things like that yeah. coming in. And I thought that was very interesting because I had never thought about it before, but with the size of the moon, I mean, that probably makes sense. It's kind of like a, a blocker, you know, just deflecting stuff off. It's both a physical blocker and also just because it has its own, it's big enough to have a meaningful enough gravity to curve things and stuff. Um, and the fact that it's really nice that the moon, it, it's, you know, orbit around us is not, exactly the same it doesn't repeat it's kind of at an angle and it goes around so it's sweeping out bigger space than just if it was just going um in its set path um so yeah it, you know you look historically and the moon is probably one of the reasons we have life on this planet because eventually it, it really slowed down the meteor showers and kept things um kept things a bit safe yeah no it makes makes perfect sense um you know you touched on the pandemic uh, you know, a lot of people that I've, I've talked with, you know, especially since doing the podcast, you have believers, non-believers, not necessarily non-believers in this non-existent. Obviously we know people are getting sick, but then a lot of people say the numbers aren't far off from, you know, deaths from the normal flu. This one's just right. a little bit more publicized. Obviously it happened around a, a presidential debate. So there's, or a presidential election. So that's going to raise the, the bar on certain things. Now I think it's become very money driven, uh, with all these tests and, you know, the, obviously the vaccines that are out there now, do you think that it, it was as advertised as far as how dangerous it was, or was it maybe blown a little bit out of proportion because it swept this country? I mean, you know, really quick once it, yeah. once it started, uh, luckily to my knowledge, I've never had it or never called yeah. it. Fortunately, um, yeah. One time I was pretty sure I did, but the home test, and I'm not sure if I went far enough up there or not. Um, <laughs> they both said negative, but I tell you, I did not feel very well, but yeah. it only lasted a couple of days. I never lost taste and smell or anything like that. So, you know, I can't say 100% that I ever did have it, but what, what is your take on that? You know, I do think, I think one, I do think it was as pretty much as dangerous as people said, you know, it is a pandemic. It was, it is, and was very serious, but I think, it proves or demonstrates two interesting things about our relationship to science um, as people. One is it reminds us we're really bad at understanding risk, right? Like if you ask people if driving in a car is dangerous, right? It's highly dangerous. You know, your chance of death is still one of the greatest from driving in a car. But how many people do we really know who died in a car? When you do, it's tragic. So I, you know, I feel really bad for anyone who does. I'm lucky. I don't know anyone who died in a car accident, but I do know it is very, very dangerous. And it's more dangerous than getting in an airplane, but people are more scared of that. So as risk analysis type people, you know, we're not necessarily really good at that. So when you looked at this and you saw all the information coming out so quickly. It, I think it's hard for people to wrap their head around, well, I didn't see anyone getting sick, so how dangerous can it be, you know, yeah. and, and all of that. But if you lived somewhere like my brother's um, in Westchester, where it was one of the first places early on that it swept their city, they even had the National Guard come in, Yeah. Um, you know, and they had such an intense cluster. I think people there were like, oh, wait, this is really real. So our, our intuition is not always great. And that causes challenges when you're trying to, deal with a public risk um, and how to communicate it. The other thing for me that was fascinating to watch, um, you know, again, a lot of tragedy for many people. So it's hard. I notice when there's tragedy or stressful things, I go into my scientist mode and just start analyzing stuff. It's my yeah. safety mechanism. <laughs> but most people don't realize that the process of science is usually one of making mistakes first and finding out what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's really tough when what you're trying to study is killing people, right? Because you want to take action, right? We know a lot more about viruses and disease than, say, people in the 1600s. Yeah. So even though we didn't know a lot about COVID, there were basic things we could give advice on. And you want to give advice quickly. But you're trying to balance specific advice for this disease versus general advice based on other diseases. 
And so not everything in the first, I don't know, two to five months was accurate and specific for COVID. Like none of the advice coming out of CDC and stuff was dangerous for you to do. Right. But it didn't necessarily help against COVID until they learned more. It was their best guess. Right. And that's what science, it's that whole hypothesis test thing, right? You go with something, you test it out. So when you look at it on the flip side, no one, no other time in history have we been able to make a vaccine as fast as we did. That, our, that's very correct. Our ability to do science, you know, the tools we have, the techniques is light years ahead of where people were even just 10 years ago. It's amazing. And, but you have all of this happening while they're stressed. Like you said, well, there's a political election going on. Well, there's like, it really just shows that science is not just the science. It's also what's happening in society. It's communication, it's emotion. It's all of that wrapped together. So someday when we're all calm, somebody's going to do a great study on what happened. <laughs> yeah. And I think you made up a great point doing it that fast. I think was what had a lot of people maybe skeptical or nervous of yeah. doing the vaccine because it's like, you know, you, you have nothing to gauge that on except past, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, okay. So when this happened, it took this long to do when this happened, it took this long to do. And then bam, they got one here like that. So it's like, maybe they might've rushed it a little bit, you know, that's pretty quick. So I can see where a lot of people were skeptical, but I also see the point where a lot of people, you know, especially older people, um, you know, hopped on it because it was by yeah. and large, a lot of times it was, it was really hurting the older, you know, people yes. that were up in age. Um, so immediately, you know, my mom, uh, my dad, my stepdad, all those jumped on the vaccines really quick. And I understood that. Um, yeah. My daughter, uh, who was 21 actually got it. And that was like a point of contention between me and her. Cause she's like, you're not going to get it. And I'm like, no, not right now. And she's like, why not? And I'm just like, I want to see a little bit more, you know, I mean, I, I yeah. want to get, I want to get a little bit more info and I don't know whether she was peer pressured into doing it or whether she wanted to do it. Cause they actually came to her job and they weren't making people get it, but they were offering it and yeah. she did it. And then she got the booster. And then of course you have people coming out saying that they got really sick. And then even with it, you still got it, but supposedly not to the effect you would have. Right. Would have. Well, and that's always, that's the other psychological challenge, right? If you're vaccinated for things, I mean, we have the flu vaccine every year for years now, and you still can get the flu with the flu vaccine, but it, your, your defense mechanisms are better, right? And so, you know, I, I, def, I had it in December tested positive, but would not have tested if I hadn't just traveled. And, you know, for work, it was good practice to test after you traveled. So I did. I and my whole family, the five of us had gone together. Three of us got it, two didn't. We were all vaccinated, all boosted, but none of us had it serious. Now, th that's the interesting thing about science. I can't do the experiment of, well, how bad would it have been without the vaccine? But I'm really glad it was super mild. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, and I do think the vaccine helped with that. I will say, you know, this, this whole idea, it made me, you know, when it all happened, I was curious and I, and I did research a little bit like the origins of vaccines and didn't realize there, I think it was like the 1700s with smallpox was when the idea was first discovered that if I give you a little bit of smallpox, you get just a teeny sick, but then you never get sick again. And, and people started doing that. Can you imagine those first people? Someone goes, hey, you know what you should do? You should like just get, rub a little of this stuff on, you get a little sick and then you'll be fine. Like, who's going to believe that? <laughs> Well, I believe that. No, no, I mean, I wouldn't have believed it back then, but I'm saying now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was that first guy. I'm like, you do it. I'll see how yeah. you do it. And exactly. You know it. But you know. My, my wife's mom worked in a hospital and she's around people all the time that had it. And she was like, you know, she never got it. She never got it. And that's what people started saying was when you actually have like, maybe if you're around some of those small doses of it, whatever, then you kind of build up and slowly build up an immune to it. You know, that it's not smacking you full blown COVID. Yeah, exactly. A little bit. I, I've read stories where people that handle, um, you know, poisonous snakes will purposely inject themselves with a little bit of venom and almost get their system used to it. That way, if they do get bit, it's not a, you know, a shock. And not instant. Yeah. And, and I, I've never been willing to try that or dare it. I do no. know. I do know it works better with some poisons than not others. So like I would probably pick the wrong one and it wouldn't work well. Yeah, I would do something definitely wrong. I would hit the wrong snake or the wrong vein or something. And, you know, me trying to test the waters and 
you know, my yeah. family's getting together or something for me making a stupid mistake. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, when you – do you teach classes now still, Kurt? Well, you said you were kind of – you're more up the yeah. food chain now, right? Yeah, but I do do one class um, a year. And I, we have this really cool class I've got involved in. It's for our honor students. Um, we call it Sustainable Societies. And I know sustainable it can be kind of a buzzword or – mean things but it really we use it in the traditional english sense of right. how do you make a city that really just functions you know thinking about um you know clean water transportation housing you know all the aspects food food delivery and so it's actually a a, a two-year course um and i do one quarter in it um do a little bit of the science and it, the students end the last two quarters they do group projects where we find real issues facing cities. Um, could be everything, you know, from homelessness to public transportation issues to, um, like I said, clean water. There was one, you know, um, a coastal city, how to, they were dealing with their breakwater. Like how do you repair it, rebuild it? And the students have to come up with a, the technology and science behind any solutions, the economics of it, the social sort of acceptance of it, or could they get it through? You know, do you do it through businesses? Do you do it through government? Do you do it through public awareness? You know, and then they've got to write a, a full on proposal and make a pitch. So the students love it. it it's a great course. I really enjoy it. They do that it. on actual like things that are currently wrong. They're basing that off actual. Yep. We, we, oh, our goal is, you know, Irvine, UC Irvine's in Orange County. Our goal is to focus on Orange County issues. So we're reaching out to the government, businesses. Um, I'd really like to hear from businesses like, what's your biggest problem with getting workers in the city or having happy workers or doing stuff and have our students do that? Um, well, it's a fairly new course. So the first couple of years we did what any person would do. We Googled problems yeah. <laughs> and we grabbed them off the internet. <laughs> yeah. That's about the best way. That's just like anything now, like a problem with a car or, you know, whatever I go, I go straight to YouTube and a yeah. lot of times it's, it's helpful. It's a great tool. Um, I remember uh, not too long ago, my dryer went out and I go to Lowe's and they had like an open box one, you know, they're usually a hundred right. cheaper. So I think it had like a scratch on the side. So they had it marked down even more. So I'm like, I'll take it the way my stuff's set up. You can't see the side anyway. Right. So we loaded into the car. It was bought, you know, sold as is I get it home and you know, I put it actually it's a washing machine. So we put a load in there. I'm trying to see what's, and this thing was bouncing so hard it was coming off the damn floor. Like I didn't know oh, what was wow. going on. I'm, I'm trying to like sit over top of it and hold it down. My son's like thinking something's going wrong. Like it's about to blow up. My wife's laughing, trying to get her phone out and record it. I'm just <laughs> like, all right, I don't know what's going on, but something's going on. And what it was, was it's like the, the pins in the back that hold that drum in place right. while it's being shipped weren't taken out. And oh. I didn't have a box or anything to tell me that because it was bought open box. So right. there wasn't any instructions and I didn't know it. So <laughs> once I went back there, I, I seen him, I Googled it. And it was like, you know, if it's doing this, it's probably still got, I, they had a name for it, but it, like yeah. holding pins or something like that. So I took those out and then it was, you know, it was good to go. But because I had no box or no instructions, I didn't know what the heck was going on. I mean, it was about to bounce out into the highway out there, but you know, it, using a tool like Google immediately, it, it helped fix the problem where if, you know, if you hadn't had that at your disposal or if I hadn't had it at my disposal, rather I'd have probably had to take it back. Cause I wouldn't know, but it's helped yeah. so many people with so many different, you know, problems in life. It's really a great tool. No, it, it is amazing how much information we have available to us now. And I think, you know, going back to some of these things we've talked about, like thinking about the aliens and whether they visit or not, I think, there, there's the positive of all that great information and there's the challenge which I think about a lot is like how do we learn to think about information um, in a world where some things you can make decisions yourself pretty easily from the facts but some things actually do take having a little bit of expertise and how do you know when and how to trust experts and how do you know who is an expert and that's one of the things I did a lot in my science of superhero course is talked about how do you know if something is both appropriate for science to be answering the question. And if science is the right tool, um, you know, how do you know someone's being scientific? And the thing that people often forget is in science, our biggest thing is talking about our error, what we don't know. Right. If someone doesn't tell you the error bar, they don't tell you how unsure they are, they're probably not doing science. 
If they tell you they're 100% totally perfectly um, certain, it, it's probably something else. They might be right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's probably not science. Well, see, I mean, and we spoke earlier, you know, I'm a welder. So it, it's yeah. one of those professions to where I can weld something up and it might have to be x-rayed after the fact. I can weld it up. And to me as a welder, I'll say, hey, I've done this the way it's supposed to be. But the, the odd part about it is somebody else comes in with a machine that can't do what I do, but right. can tell me if I did it wrong. <laughs> you know, and that's the problem. Sometimes that can rub people the wrong way. I'm, I'm not so much like that as the fact that I can say, well, I'm pretty sure it's right, but, you know, I'm going to trust your tool to be able to tell me. Yeah. Um, you know, he can't tell me how to do it, but he can tell me if it's done right. No, I love that. That's a great example. And it goes to show how important both the tools to do stuff and the tools to measure stuff are. And they're yep. kind of different things. Um, I will tell you. So, you know, one of the great things I got to do as, you know, um, in grad school as I was kind of physicist is work in the machine shop a lot because yep. um, we built our own apparatuses and simple things I got to build myself. Anything slightly complicated, I gave to the machinist. <laughs> and I will tell you, that's the number one reason I think people built all the stuff in the past. I have never met more creative, you know, um, intelligent, talented, problem-solving people. Um, you know, you, you come in and you're like convinced there's no way to make the part. And they're like, well, you just do this and this on the lathe and this over here on the end mill. And then we do this. And here, here's your part, Mike. And I'm like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, People that and, have that ability, man, they can make up some apparatuses that'll that'll make the job a whole lot easier. We have sometimes yeah. we get things in our business that's repetitive, like you need eight hundred and something made, and we'll figure out a way to. It might take a couple of hours, you know, figure out the yeah. best way. But you come up with something that makes that eight hundred go by really, really fast, as opposed to taking a long amount of time. <laughs> to do that. People say by nature, welders are like lazy people because we can do it laying down if we want, um, <laughs> but we, we always figure out a way to make the job easier. But I feel like that's probably something everyone should do. You know, there's no reason oh. to do it harder if you can do it easier. No, I think you're so right to take that moment of creativity, figure out what's going to make it easier on yourself and then do it that way in the end saves a ton of time. Um, I do like to joke that I'm a pretty lazy academic. I always try. I, I don't get to lie down, but I would love to if I could. And I try and find the easiest way to do things. Yeah, we don't typically lay down. We can. There, there are situations sometimes where you got to. But I tell people, tell me, like, how do you think patents were made? Somebody at some point in time said, that's not the easiest way to do this. So they come up with something and they got a patent and now you're buying it, you know, without even thinking. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, I forgot that uh, that adage that somebody said, you know, if you save somebody some time or something, but if it saves money, I forgot what it was exactly, but it's, it's so true because you can come up with something and people will say you're lazy, but then at the same time, somebody else will look at it and say, well, oh, that's that's like, you know, game changing right there. We need it. So it's, it's yeah, I, I, how those things I think the only thing that people lied to us about was when they said computers were going to save us time. Because I only find myself busier and busier because the computer makes me do so much more. <laughs> Especially on this show, man. Like I find myself doing so much related to the show. Like you're researching this, you're you're researching yep. that. And then it's such a rabbit hole to go down because just like, you know, researching you today, I wound up listening on stuff about, you know, aliens by themselves and then black <laughs> holes. And I mean, it's it's easy to lose hours going down rabbit holes with stuff because there's so much content out there. It is. Well, I'll tell you, I'm going to make an ad for a number, another one of our F triple GBT episodes because we talked about the matrix in our last season. Okay. And I, I'm very proud of pointing out that I claim we are now in the wireless matrix, right? The big question we, we asked is really, if, if people remember the movie, the matrix, yeah. they all think about, you know, the virtual world you're in. They forget that the whole point was the humans were the batteries for the machines. Um, we were plugged in and they were using us for energy. And I realized while we were recording that, that there I am always worrying about making sure my cell phone is charged, my computer is charged. I am the battery for my machine. It's just a wireless matrix. And I walk around plugging them in all the time. So these are the brilliant insights we have in our podcast. Yeah. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. Cause I just took a trip to New York and like, if you're not from New York, that's not a place you want to be without a cell phone to try to right. get around. And my battery, for whatever reason, I guess it's just been ran dead so many times. Like it just seems to go dead like that. 
So I've got like two battery packs that I keep. That way I don't have to worry about finding a plug in. And you're, you're absolutely right. That's that you're always charging that phone and you're, that, that makes a ton of sense. <laughs> yep. Yep. That, that's who we are. We are, we are the batteries for the machines and the equipment. Um, they, now, they keep else, us on our toes. Something else I heard you discuss, and I thought it was pretty interesting. You said that you believe probably, I don't know the year marker, and I guess we'll ask you about that, but we're probably not too far from maybe getting to the point to where you said we either got to go down maybe as far as like maybe possibly figuring out a way to live underwater or go to another planet. You spoke about Mars and possibly going up to Mars. What are your thoughts on both of those and maybe which one's closer to being a reality and which one's a little further away? Yeah, it, it, they're, they're two very distinct problems and issues. Um, you know, underwater, you're, you're dealing with massive pressure and right. you're also dealing with the fact that salt water corrodes most things we know how to make. Right. So it's really a material science problem. How do you make a material that's going to survive the pressure, not corrode, not rust and fall apart? Um, Mars, you know, I view it more as a transportation issue. I mean, yes, you have to deal with the fact that Mars doesn't quite have the atmosphere we need. You'd have to do some artificial atmosphere generation, um, figure out what to do with water, since if there is any, it's all in a frozen state and it's not clear how much. There's definitely some but you know, not, not necessarily enough to, to start with. So you're kind of terraforming um, and bringing stuff there. The nice thing is we know that Mars probably did have a pretty decent atmosphere at some point, could do it. It's just far enough away from the sun, not quite as big enough a gravity that it dissipated with time. Knowing that you could probably recreate some of it. Yeah. Um, it's just not clear how much effort that would take. So they're different problems. And I think a little bit depends which we, which we get to first. Yeah, which and also to, in my mind, I've always thought this, you know, which people will think they can make money out of first money is a great motivator. Um, and to the degree that we're starting to understand, I just saw this the other day, you know, with the private, you know, SpaceX and other private companies, there is, you know, valuable materials we can get from the moon which is closer and possibly from Mars. And as that starts to become a way to make money at the same time, um, I think people are gonna find that maybe a little sooner than fully underwater. Um, but we are, we, are, we are stressing this planet um, yeah. you know, in interesting ways. And we're stressing each other because we're kind of getting crammed in certain places. Um, and so I do think I've always, I told you at the beginning, I've, I've loved space travel. I think it's an amazing thing. I hope we get to it in my lifetime. Um, so I'm voting for Mars. Um, I mean, living underwater would be cool, but not nearly as exciting. Well, that's what I was thinking because like, you know, there's so much more you can probably find and, and research, you know, going to Mars where when you're underwater, you're just underwater. I mean, there's, yeah, no exactly. you know, you can't go out and explore. You're stuck in whatever you're in. I seen a picture one time where it was saying like hotel is going to be underwater or something like that. And I'm like, you know, I don't even know if I could peacefully sleep in there. No one is like, if there's a crackers, I'd be scared to walk on the floor, you yeah. know, drop something. And then, you know, all hell break loose down there. I know there was a movie, uh, deep blue sea came out a couple of years back. Yes. Was, the killer shark, but they had like that whole thing up underwater that they were all yeah. in the whole time. And, you know, I thought I was like, even that, I just got claustrophobic, like watching, you know, that, so that's not something that I don't think I could probably even want to do, even if we had that capability. No, I, I, I don't think so either. I do. I am intrigued a little bit by like, what would it be to put sort of more, like we tend to build up and I get it. You get sunlight, you get skyscrapers, you do that. Um, you know, what would it take to make living underground more interesting? Yeah. Um, Cause I find that a little safer than, than water. Yeah. Um, Having grown up in Connecticut, I know my basement was the only place that was cool in the summer, <laughs> um, right? And so, you know, the ground is a great insulator. Um, you do have to get air down there and, and worry about air shafts and different things. And I know we really like natural light, but underwater, you're worried about air and light because the light doesn't go that deep. Mm -hmm. So I, I do often wonder if, if the underground idea is a little more um, viable short term than, than the water even. Yeah, I'll tell you a, a cool building. It's probably one of the coolest buildings I've ever seen just because from the outside, it doesn't look like much. And actually, one of the Matrix movies, they had it. Um, I don't know if it was two or three. I can't remember. 
Actually, I'm sorry, not The Matrix. I'm thinking of Keanu Reeves. One of the John Wick movies that he was. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's the uh, God. I can't even think of the name of the building now, but it's in New York, right beside the World Trade Center. It almost looks like a, a skeleton of a dinosaur or something. Okay. I don't know if it's Renaissance Center is not the word. I can't remember, but it, it's very cool looking. It comes. It almost looks like the skeleton of an old prehistoric dinosaur. It doesn't look that big, but when you go into it, it goes down like three stories. I mean, it's very deceiving yeah. to the eye. It's really cool yeah. looking. It's probably one of the coolest buildings I think I've ever seen as far as architectural standpoint. And that was, I guess it was in a scene of one of those movies where there's a guy, uh, a, he's a singer, but he's also an actor. His name's Common. And I guess him and John Wick have a fight throughout that whole place, which would have probably okay. been cool to see done. But I mean, just those, those types of architectures, man, are just really cool. And that's one of those situations where they went down and yep. used probably a lot of, you know, the underground stuff. Because standing there looking at it, you might just think, oh, this is a structure or a sculpture or something like that. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, but that's, that's kind of cool. I have to get the name of that and, and email it to you. I'm sure you could Google it. I, I wish I could remember, but it's it's a really cool building down there. This is very neat yeah. to see. I had been like 10 years since I had been to New York, so a lot of that stuff was new when I went down yep. there. The, uh, that was the first time I'd been since they built the new One World Trade. Right. Yeah, no, no, there's a lot there. I had the same. I went down. Um, like a month ago, I was out east visiting family and went to Manhattan for the first time in years. It's amazing, all the different things lot, did you go lot happening into the world there. Trade? We did not make it down to there. We actually spent a lot of time on the um, the uh, aircraft carrier there, which was super cool. Um, okay. It's amazing, kind of the tech and technology. You forget what they were able to do, you know, in that World War II era. Oh um, yeah. Now, the last time, lots I was of there... cables and plugs. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. I I didn't do the World and World Trade, but there's a new building called the Summit, and okay. basically, you go up about 94 floors, and it's all glass. Like everything's glass. You can walk up. You get an observation of the whole, basically the whole city, and then it's got another level above that where you can go and have drinks and look out. Then it's even something above that where you can get in like this all glass elevator and go up like another 10 floors. And then you really have a great view. And I didn't opt to do that. But <laughs> on the top floor where the bar was, there's a section. And it sits out past the building. So when you step out there, there's literally nothing under you except what your feet are on. And you have like 40 seconds to take selfies or record or whatever you right. want to do. And you look down. And I mean, it's just like, you know, cars look like matchbox cars. You know, no wow. Because you're so high up. I did step out on that. I wasn't very comfortable, so I didn't stay out there long. But, I mean, just the structures that we're able to build in today's time as opposed to, I guess, back then when, when the first two towers were built, which even those were pretty astounding buildings at yeah. the time. But now, man, it's it's crazy the things that can be built, you know, and with well, today's technology. It amazes me how much glass they put in the buildings. Yes. You're like, steel and concrete, I understand. But we have clearly figured out how to do things with glass that, you know, just make it way more stable. Because those buildings, they move, they've got the wind. And when you think about it, I mean, I love materials and material science. The way that glass has to be able to flex and bend and its strength, the combination of properties is just uh, mind-boggling. I find that really cool. Yeah, and especially that, man, because, like, when you're standing on that, I, I'm looking right – because I am in the business of welding and, and you know, buildings and stuff, I'm looking to like, all right, what's supporting this? I'm kind of yeah, exactly. you know, maybe a little <laughs> bit more say. than the average person. I'm looking around I'm like, all right, so what's keeping that thing from just dropping right out the bottom? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and I'm, I'm not seeing it, but then again, I don't work with glass. I don't know the intricacies yeah. of, you know, how they do that, but you know, obviously it's a really cool building. There's a lot of mirrors in there. And that's another thing that it's like really, it's really cool illusions because you can look up and you know, you see like 25 of yourself and then you, yeah, look no, uh, and you see a bunch of, it's really cool how they designed it. Yeah. That's awesome. I was thinking you probably were hoping they came in and checked whoever did the work, just like they check your work to make sure yeah, it's right. Yeah. Well, I would yeah. hope so. You're letting everybody stand out there on that thing for 45 <laughs> seconds. It was like, they, they would give you a timer. Like they had a thing that would take your picture and then they would set it up to where like the whole day went by. So it was like a time lapse. Oh, really nice. Cool. 
and then you had cool. a certain amount of time to take your own stuff, and then you had to get out because obviously a lot of people want to do it. They don't oh, want yeah. to be there hogging up the whole time, so yeah. they put you on a limit and then you know route you on through. But I just thought it was it was really neat. Um, you know, I do want to get up to the top of the One World Trade at uh, at some point. Obviously, you know, we just passed the nine eleven yeah. anniversary. You know, what is your thoughts? You know, and this may be out of your wheelhouse, but you know, with the capabilities that they're building and buildings these days, is there something that we're going to be able to do to prevent like, you know, something like that from happening again? You know, I think we're always learning new lessons. You know, I think, you know, in that case, it did show that at the end of the day, everything has a melting point, everything has a structural issue. You know, it is really tragic and scary that someone thought of it, but jet fuel just burns really hot and is an amazing, you know, sort of bomb basically right and so that's that's what we saw was that destructive power you know i i live in california now and and what we can do with earthquakes is amazing right just our ability to figure out the mechanics of it and test it and it comes back down to um the creativity of people with materials you know early on early humans figured out oh my gosh you know you can make bronze and then you can make steel and we just keep getting better and we're really um that was the fun thing about my research. It's, you know, understanding the, what we like to call the mesostructure, like how the little pieces fit together to make things either stronger or more flexible right. or, you know, better resistant or higher melting temperature. And you're trying to balance, you know, think through all the possible ways something could fail um, and also how to comp- compartmentalize the damage, yeah. you know, right? Like, it's a big challenge in one of our buildings because I work near chemistry labs where the most common fire is going to be a chemical fire. You don't want to put water on. Right. Cause that makes it worse. Right. Some people forget that water doesn't put out all fires. Yeah. There's different right? classes of fire. Some of you do not want to put water on. water on. And so you have to design that part of the building differently right. with firewalls and other things so fire that and different you things. can keep, you can keep the rest of the building safe, but you're not going to put sprinklers there, right. you know? And so these are, you know, these are the challenges, but I think, you know, it's human history has always been this race between safety and danger. Um, That's great. And, I, like that. I like that. And we're really good at both, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think too, a lot of people forget, you know, I've always, the, the whole day, I mean, obviously it was a tragedy, but a lot of it has always fascinated me of the depths that they went into to pull it off, as well as, you know, what we're going to do now to combat that. But when they left, they left from airports closer to New York. I think both of the first two planes that hit the towers were bound for Boston. So they got enough jet fuel on there to get them basically to the other side of the United States. So loaded to the brim, not a, not a, you know, a lower level plane with a gas tank. So they prepped very well, you know, for that. Um, and I think those are things yeah. that people do forget because it's not only just that, you know, not only was it just what was on the plane and the jet engine and the fuel on the plane, but then once it went in, you set the building on fire. So then you got exactly everything in there burning. And I yeah. know there's all sorts of conspiracy theories about, you know, this, that, and the other, and I'm not going to get into that, but you know, it, it was just one thing led to a many of others. I don't know if they thought that all the way through. I don't even know if they thought that the towers would fall. I was always yeah. kind of curious because a know, lot of people a, didn't think they would. It's a good question. I mean, I think they, they knew very well how much damage it would occur. Right. Right. And so um, either way, it, w- it would have been a tragedy. And and yes, getting getting them to fall just made it worse. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, the second one that hit, Obviously, if you notice on that one, it kind of hit it almost like a banked angle, like when yeah. it went sideways, because that one fell first. The first one that was basically like a head on in straight through the side of the building was the second one to fall. It looked like that second one to hit probably compromised more of the, the structural integrity of the building. Which exactly. Which to fall first. Yeah, particularly since I think, you know, I, I don't I have to admit, this is where my, my knowledge of buildings I, fascinates me, but it always fails, you know, but I think all buildings, so much of the load is on the outside these days. Right. Right. And so taking more of the outside is probably more critical than, like you said, going right into the middle. Yeah. 
Well, it's been a fun talk, man. Uh, you're you're a, a yeah. guest. Uh, it's been a, a blast having you on. I was worried if I was going to be able to get enough conversation in here to hold it. I was nervous putting you on here, man. I thought, hey, no, I'm don't. Way smarter than me. <laughs> well, I, I, I have one key skill, and that's talking a lot. <laughs> it's gotten me very far in life. Well, that, that puts you on a great platform here with me because that's what I like to do, too. And, you know, yeah. I, I'm just teasing, really. I, I can talk yeah. really with anybody. I tell people, you know, there's like, well, how do you prep for this person, that person? I said, well, I do research. I was yeah. like, but I only do it for a certain amount. Once I get a base of kind of what they do and what they, you know, what they're about, I'm going to ask questions I want to ask. So, yeah, no, and that's. Yeah. That's what that's what it's about, and 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 I loved I loved answering them and talking about them, um, and so and happy to come back and chat. I'll tell you, I do the physics, the science of X. Um, if you want to be bold and brave, you know the other big X. So I do the superheroes and the you know all the pop culture. That's the F triple G B T stuff where we like to make pop culture a reality. Right. Um, and I do that with two other guys, you know Daniel J Glenn and and Ben Seepser. But my other half of my life of the science of X is even though I don't do politics, I'm crazy enough to do religion. So I do the science of religion where I love consciousness, free will, all these things. And I'm even going to put in a plug for my book, Divine Science, Finding Reason at the Heart of Faith. I was so actually going to ask you, did you want to plug your, yeah. your books? Because yeah. author was a thing I think I forgot in the beginning. You had yeah, no, continue. no, that's okay. Um, yeah, I have my one book out there, Divine Science, Finding Reason at the Heart of Faith. And it's on Amazon and all the usual places. Um, but I do, it is something I find very interesting that often just gets, gets the only the extreme views out there. I joke, my book didn't really become super famous because I wasn't extreme enough. I'm right. kind of in the middle. Anyone in the middle doesn't get much traction, but... Well, I've seen a video that you had, like, uh, I think it was on faith or something like that. Yep, faith something and science. Faith. Yep. faith and science. That was what it was. And I wasn't sure if it was the same guy because I'm like, well, this is the guy from Aliens and Superheroes. Yeah. And I'm like, is this the same guy? And I seen all the videos that I was like, man, I need like two months to prep for all this. <laughs> all the videos you got out there. Now, like I said, X is a pretty big thing, even if you exclude politics. But I have fun talking about it all. Well, are you on any sort of like social medias for people to follow you on there? Or what about I am. Um, Twitter and Instagram are the big ones where I'm at Den and Michael. You just flip my name. Okay. Um, and then I am on Facebook some at Prof Den and Michael, but I'm, I'm much more Twitter. Um, there is a web page with all my stuff tends to get gathered. It's a little long. It's michaeldenon.ovptl.uci.edu. Yeah, you're but gonna I put just, that one in there and I'll tag it. <laughs> yeah, but I just got denonmichael.com. Uh, and so as soon as I get that up and linked, I'll be much easier to find because everything will be Den and Michael. Yeah, that one I could probably get. And I can remember that yeah. one. That other one sounded like you're reading off of iChart of the DMV. No, it is. But <laughs> again, as we mentioned with Google, if you just Google Den and Michael or Michael Denon, you yeah. find all my websites and all my stuff. So. All right, well, good deal, man. Look, I'm, I'm, I had a blast, man. I'm glad you was able to come on the show. I really appreciate you stopping by. Great. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed being here. Absolutely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am Hollywood Wade. That was Michael Denon, and unfortunately, we are out of time. Tune in next week for an all-new episode of Crime, this one with a little bit of science and entertainment. Michael, we appreciate it, my friend. Great to be here.